Well, good morning, and I'm so glad that you have decided to join us today. Uh, we have spent the summer in Galatians and the last couple of weeks talking about next step of faith, and today, today we are picking back up. In Romans, right? I said that we're going to kind of take it little by little, chunk by chunk, uh, because it's a lot. It can be a lot, and it's heavy. Uh, And today, we are going to be in Romans 5, 12 through 21, if you want to go ahead and turn there. And I'm just going to tell you, this is one of the most challenging passages in the New Testament uh, for grammar and interpretation, right? But, I, but don't, we're, not, we're not scared. We're not scared of that. Uh, we're going to hit that head on. And let me tell you, this is one of these, one of these places in the, in the New Testament that can be taken out of context and, and highly misunderstood. Uh, and one of the reasons it's done that is because people don't take it within the big picture. The big picture. You have to have to look at the big picture when you look at a passage like Romans 5. So if we think back, you know, it's been some months. When we started looking at Romans, we said that, that the past, and, and this is a real letter written by Paul, a real person, to other real people, the, a group of churches in Rome made of Jews and Gentiles, and it's written In the past, I mean, and we've said that the past is like a foreign country. They do things differently there, and this is written in Greek rhetorical style, and that doesn't really mean much to us, except for that when we read it, we have to remember it's not written like an email. It's not written like a letter to the editor. It's not even really written like books that we have today. It is Greek rhetorical style, and this was Paul writing to a group of people that he'd never met writing to get them to, you know, to, to partner with him, to get them to, to be unified because you have Jews and Greeks and, and the Jews were kicked out of Rome uh, by Claudius in 49 and they're let back in five years later. And five, you know, five years later, all the, the non-Jewish people have continued on with the church. And so they're kind of discombobulated. And so Paul's writing to help them be unified, but, but more importantly, Paul is writing this to make a very common understanding, a very common understanding of God and Jesus and the gospel. And so he is, this people he's never known, this people he's never met that he's going to go meet, he hopes to one day. He says, this is why I'm writing you in this, he, in Greek rhetorical style, in this style that we're not used to. He gives something that we are used to, a thesis sentence, right? You, tenth grade English, you wrote a thesis statement. He gives his thesis statement in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am very proud of this gospel. Very proud of the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, and he quotes Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. So that's his thesis statement. And then he spends the next four chapters, the next a bit, right? And it wasn't, he didn't even write this in chapters, right? So we can't even say that about Paul. He spends the next, the first quarter of the letter and a little more talking about why, why the gospel is for everyone and it's necessary for everyone, no matter where you come from, no matter who you are, whether you're Jew and you have the law, or whether you're Gentile and you don't have the law, no matter who you are, you need the gospel. Everyone needs salvation. No one has earned it. No one deserves it. No one's good enough and smart enough. Uh, No one deserves salvation, but we all need it. And so the gospel provides it. You see, everyone has this problem, and the gospel, right? Everyone has this problem, and Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the solution to everyone's problem, to your problem, to my problem, to everyone that's ever lived's problem. Jesus is the solution. He's the only answer. 
Now, up until now, I mean, he's, he's said this a thousand ways. He's like, hey, if you've never heard of God, you still have this problem. If, you've, if you're a Jew and have been given the oracles of God, the, 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 the scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament, you have a problem. If you've been really good, you have a problem. If you've been really bad, you have the same problem. We all have the problem, and Jesus is the answer. Now, he hasn't talked about Adam in this, in this whole, up to this point. But he's going to use Adam to explain a sentence he wrote just a, 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 just a few verses before in Romans 5.8. It's a pretty popular verse in Romans, if you've, if you've memorized verses. It says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he's going to now use Adam to explain this thing that he wrote. Hey, so while you were a sinner, while I was a sinner, and while everyone was a sinner, Christ died for us, sinners. And you may be thinking, and then maybe it's like, well, what do you mean I'm a sinner? <laughs> I mean, I know there are lots of people out there that are sinners and bad people, but... but, but he doesn't know me. Paul doesn't know me. He doesn't know you. He doesn't, he doesn't know us. And how does he, how does he, he doesn't know my life. He doesn't know why I do things. You know, where does Paul get off calling me a sinner? I mean, I mean, you probably are, but me? I don't know. And Paul's going to give us, an, he's going to give us an explanation using Adam of why he can confidently say, while we were still sinners, and he can be talking about anybody Christ died for. He, he, he can confidently say that you are a sinner and I am a sinner, or at least were. <laughs> Let's read Romans 5, 12, 13, and 14. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So here we go. Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. So Adam. And Moses is the giver of the law. So, so from the beginning of people till Moses, till the law, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So Paul is saying, you have a problem and I have a problem because of Adam. Sin entered the world through one person. And, and death entered because of sin, right? Sin, sin got in and then it opened the door, right? It was... It, it, uh, <laughs> It was like a jailbreak, right? One person got out and he opened up the doors for everybody else. And that came from one person, Adam. And now Paul's going to go ahead and say, you know what? And the law didn't even matter. This is not a problem because of the law. This is a problem for all humans of all time. Paul is going to tell you and he's going to tell me the same thing Billy Joel told us. We didn't start to fire, right? That's, that's some good news. You didn't start it. I didn't start. Right? We didn't start to fire. It's always been burning since the world's been turning, right? We couldn't. We, we tried to fight it. I mean, he, he told us all of this, right? Very, the great theologian, Billy Joel. But it turns out the person that started the fire is Adam. Adam. Now, who is Adam? Now, to Paul, Adam is a real person. He is not a construct. He is not a myth. He is not a type. He is not about, you know, some proto-man. He's not cro mat He is a real person who really existed at some point at the beginning of history and all these things really happen, right? This, now, 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 listen, sometimes it's easy to say, well, oh, Paul is ancient, and ancient people are dumb. That is not the case. Okay, this is, <laughs> Adam says, I mean, Paul says this, this Adam had to come because this, at some point, there had to be an Adam. 
Because without Adam, you can't explain all this other stuff. If Adam is not the father of everyone, if Adam, if you can't trace everybody's family tree back to Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman that God made, if you can't trace them all back, if there's multiple Adams and multiple Eves, then this problem we're talking about is not really a problem. It can't really exist. And so Adam is this real person. And so what does he do? And Paul tells us. He sinned. He's going to later say that it's a transgression. And if, you, if you've been following along in Romans, you, you know that, that, that every transgression is a sin, but not every sin is a transgression. Now, now, the difference is, and you're going to read that in Romans, the difference is a sin is to do something outside of what God wants. A transgression is to knowingly do so. A transgression, like a sin, a sin would be, I mean, like in, in, you know, in like our common, you know, in everyday life, you, you would sin against somebody. Let's say you walk around the corner and you cut somebody off at the grocery store, right? That's, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, crazy stuff here. You cut somebody off and they're like, hey, you cut me off. You go, oh, I didn't see you. Sorry, right? Oh, so, sorry, I didn't know that you were there. Oh, sorry, I didn't know, you know, a little kid, a little kid takes, uh, you know, I mean, I'm talking a little kid, like a, like a six-month-old. You're holding a six-month-old. You're at the gas station. The six-year-old grabs candy and walks at, you know, and, and you're carrying him, and they walk out with it. That, that, little, that little toddler did not transgress. He sinned. He stole something. He doesn't, he doesn't know. But a transgression is when someone says, hey, don't do this. Do not, whatever you do, do this. And you say, okay, I will not do that. And then you do it. That's a transgression. And that's why it's even a little worse than a sin in what Paul's talking about here. And Adam is, is, is living in the garden. He, is, he has a perfect life. Uh, God's made him a perfect mate. He, he tends the garden. He walks with God every day. He lives his perfect life. And he wakes up every morning and goes, okay, I got one thing on my do not do list. One thing, and that is don't eat from this specific tree. Don't eat the fruit from this specific tree. And he can't even do that, right? Because one day he does that. He, he sins. And, and when he sins, whenever he eats, of, whenever he does the thing, whenever he transgresses, whenever he does the one thing that God says, absolutely, positively, do not do this. And he goes, okay, I won't. I, I promise. And then does it anyways. That is when sin enters the world. And it doesn't just enter in for him, it also, it also enters in uh, for Eve as well. But it didn't just enter in for those two, it enters in for all of us, for you and for me and everyone you've ever known and everyone will ever know. This is called original sin. And the reason that we, that, 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 that Paul says you... As sin entered in, in through one person and, and through, and it rained, death rained, right? And through sin, like when, and when sin entered, death entered, and it rained, right? Like death had dominion, it had control. That's called federal headship, okay? Federal headship. It's like, well, how does that affect me, Aaron? Because I'm not there. I wasn't there. I didn't tell Adam to do it. I didn't tell Eve to do that. I didn't do that. Well, it's federal headship. And what, that, what federal headship is, federal headship is, is, is when a very important person represents you. Now, we understand this in a representative government. You might not vote on something, or you might not like the way that your representative votes, but whenever they cast the vote, it is representative of you. Federal headship. Federal headship is whenever the president of the United States, and you are a, a member of this country, when you, when you are here, you know, if you're a citizen of this country, whenever, if they declare war on another country, even if you like the country, you 
And that you, you are persona non grata in that country because you are a resident. Now, on the other hand, federal headship really does some nice stuff sometimes. I, uh, I was on a flight uh, from, from here to Dubai, and then I was going from Dubai to India, and we could, I, I was said, oh, I hear that you can like get around and walk, you know, get out, get off the plane, get out of the airport and walk around in Dubai. And the guy sitting next to me, he says, well, you can do that, but I can't. I said, well, why not? And he goes, because, and he goes, because you have that, you have that blue passport. You have an American passport. You have a golden ticket because your country is friends with so many countries. You can just get out and kind of do what you want. He goes, I'm from this other country. Our, our, you know, the head of our country doesn't like the head of Dubai, and so we cannot get out and walk around. <laughs> Got to stay in the airport. So, federal headship, where one person speaks for, represents the whole. And you may not like it, and we're going to talk about that at the end today. You may not like it, but it's the way it is, because this is how Paul is dealing with it. And so, we see that, that, that God, here's how he deals with the first sin, how he deals with Adam's transgression. Well, first, let me just even tell you, it's not even the first sin. It's not even the first sin. Who sins first? Eve does. But who does God hold responsible? Who does he come looking for? Adam. So even in that, even in that situation, right, he says, okay, husband, Okay, husband, you, you are responsible. You are the head of that family. So who does God hold responsible? He doesn't come looking for Eve, and you can read it in Genesis 3. He comes looking for Adam. And he says, where are you? He says, well, I was, I was naked, and you came around, right? I mean, if you're Texan, it's naked. He says, I knew you were looking for me. And I was naked, so I hid. And he's like, well, how did you know, right? I mean, now, now God know, knows all this stuff. And he says, hey, did you do the thing you weren't supposed to do? And he's like, I mean, I did, but, right? And he goes immediately and blames the woman. And he says, well, what about you? And she immediately blames the snake. Basically, both of them said, hey, this, this thing that you made really went haywire, right? Adam's like, this woman you made, right? Was, hopefully that's like the beta version, right? We're not done with her, are we? We got we to gotta keep, keep doing more because she, she's, she's leading me astray, right? And then, you know, Eve, did you, did you do the thing you weren't supposed to do? And she's like, you know, if, if, if you really wouldn't have made that snake, we would have been okay. <laughs> if you hadn't, uh, man, he, he was there, you know, kept, kept him out of the garden, we would have been fine. If you'd have dug a better hole, you know, put in a better fence around this garden. Now, let me just go in for a second because we, we see this a lot in, in, the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament, about headship, especially in families and when it comes to church. Let me just say this, okay? Adam, though he didn't sin firstly, he sinned solely. I mean, mean, uh, he sinned primarily, not solely. God held him responsible. God held him responsible, not solely responsible, but primarily responsible for this thing. And this is how God deals with leadership and authority. And that's how he deals with leadership and authority in the family, these two institutions he started, in the family and in church. And you see it all throughout the Bible, that being the head, being in charge, being the leader, right, being an authority does not mean more privilege. It means more responsibility. Now, hear me, guys. Guys, this is for you, okay? Being an authority. God says, hey, you, you know, men, be the leader of your household. You know, be the leader of your family. If you are a leader in, 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 in a spiritual organization, like if you're a leader at Grace Church, then you are not, it, is, it has nothing to do with being a greater, having greater value. We are all equal. It has nothing to do with greater value. It has nothing to do with privilege. It has everything to do with greater responsibility and a greater burden. That is what leadership is. Period. 
Being in charge doesn't mean being a boss. Doesn't mean kicking your feet up on the desk. Doesn't mean making everybody else do everything. Being a leader. Now, hey, I mean, that doesn't mean you, de- you, it doesn't mean you don't delegate. It doesn't mean you don't do a lot of things, right? It doesn't mean that you don't let other people make decisions, right? Guys, in your, ho- in your home, if you, if, you, if you are a father and a husband, you have the responsibility. You have the responsibility to lead. That means you have to reject that passivity. That doesn't mean you can't delegate. It doesn't mean that you make all the choices. It doesn't mean that you lord it over your family. It doesn't mean any of those things. It doesn't mean that, that, that you don't do anything. And you make all, it, it, it has nothing to do with that. It means that you do what is best for them. And you may say, well, I'm not really into, I'm not really into responsibility. I just let my, I let everybody else deal with that. Well, then don't be married. Right? Don't be married. Definitely don't have kids. Don't do that. Don't do that. Take responsibility. Bear the burden. Right? Bear the burden. Whenever you say things that is, whenever, well, whenever first, whenever you don't say things, you are being like Adam, who saw his wife doing something that he had agreed not to, that she had agreed not to. He said nothing, passivity. And then he rejected the responsibility, right? Right? He, was, he, he said, well, no, no, well, I mean, you know, God said, did you, did you eat? Did you do the thing, the one thing I told you not to do? He said, yeah, but let me tell you, that woman you gave me. Don't be like that. Leadership. Leadership. It's not about privilege. It's not about value. It is about responsibility. It is about responsibility. It is about carrying your load and other people's load. And I'm going to tell you, guys, I'm trying to talk to you for a second. Guys are like, are like trucks, okay? Most guys are like trucks. They drive a little better. They drive a little straighter. They drive a little better when they have a load in the back. They just do. And if all you want to do is play video games or all you want to do is just have fun and, and all you, you just want to let your wife do whatever, uh, you know, make all the decisions and be the, you're going to abdicate responsibility to her, you are not doing what God's called you to do. Now, I'm not even saying, you know, that's, so don't hear me say, well, don't let your wife make any decisions. That has nothing to do with this. My wife makes a lot of decisions in our house, many, because she's really smart. She's a great person. She's a well-informed person, but we do it together, and we have a common goal. We are on the same page because leadership is not about being better. Leadership is not about being smarter. It's not about being, it's, it's about who is responsible when things go bad. And I'm going to tell you guys, you may not like it. God said it's you. Whether you made the decision or someone else did, God holds you responsible. You see, the sin of Adam is that he did not uphold what he knew was right, right? He was passive. And he didn't escape. Now, let me tell you, this still plays out. This still echoes the day because I bet if I were to ask you how many of you still carry around a father wound, the vast majority of you would raise your hand, men and women both. I was talking about this to somebody the other day. Uh, it, is in, it is impressive and it is astounding sometimes to me the damage a bad father can do to a person. <laughs> I mean, it is astounding. Because so many of us are still suffering because of something your father did or your grandfather. Or, or maybe, you don't even, maybe you don't even know who started it. You just know that your family always has this dysfunction. And let me just tell you, it's probably the fact that, that some dad wasn't there or some dad was horrible. Now, I'm going to tell you, by and large, 
Now, this is a stereotype, but it's one that I've seen anecdotally a lot. Most women have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility, and I don't usually have to talk to them about feeling responsible or being responsible. I typically don't. They, they have their own issues. That's, that's, that's their thing. But, but I do have to talk about that with guys. Guys, this is your role. You have to do it. You are going to be held responsible for it, whether you do it or whether you don't. See, we understand this when we look at the fight, right? That you didn't do anything. Your dad or your grandpa messed up maybe before you were born. And you still suffered the consequences. That's federal headship. It's federal headship. Like, we, like you may not like it. Like I don't like it, but we, we understand it. And so, Adam's sin was held against all mankind. And let me tell you, not only, not only did you, was that imputed, right? Was his, was his sin, was his guilt imputed to you? It was given to you. But then you followed suit. Just like we understand, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your father's an alcoholic, the likelihood of you being an alcoholic is going to be high. Well, in Adam, if you, all of Adam's children, Adam, Adam became a sinner. He sinned. And after Adam sinned, everyone had that problem. You did, I did. Right? And all your, all your struggles, everything, that, everything that, that is a problem with you stems from this generational sin that you can trace back to the very first human. Every problem in your, in, your, in your relationships, every problem in your marriage, every pro, like, like as a parent, you spend 18 years trying to get your kid not to do the thing that comes natural to them in sin. Like you didn't have to teach your kid how to say no to you, how to be selfish. Like, like nobody, was, nobody was, was teaching your kid how to hit. They just, you know, like you weren't going, like, no, 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 you know, hit me in the face, right? Or when they became toddlers and they just automatically, you know, punch you right, right in the private area. Man, it was awful. That was awful. You didn't have to teach them how to do that. They just did it. Your parent kept you, right? they, they tried to keep you from that. But even that, even that, they couldn't do it. In part, like we see this, we see this original sin. Like it, it's the it's the it's the the source of all of our problems. Now we've kind of we've gotten away from it because starting like in the 1700s, kids are seen as as either blank slates where they are not bad or not good; they're just blank when they're born, or they're only seen as good, right? And so you got you got John Locke, you got Rousseau. These guys are talking about man, if if you just let kids like if you only raise them good, then they'll be good. Well, we know that's not the case. Rousseau says, if you just take away the influence of society, if you, you know, he, he writes this book called A Meal, and it's about, you know, a, a, a kid basically getting raised by nature, and it's like, well, if you just let them be raised without the influence of society, they will be morally pure. Yeah, right. Let me just tell you, Rousseau, Rousseau had five kids, didn't raise any of them, gave them all to the orphanage, where most of them died there. And then by the time that we, you know, it's the 1700s, we get to Dr. Spock and, and we are told basically kids are good at their core. And if you just help them develop their self-esteem, then they won't have, the, they won't have any problems and they won't, they won't do the bad stuff. If you can just, you know, if the, the, just, they, they really mess up because they feel bad about themselves. And so poor, you know, you know good self-esteem will fix it, right? And so you do that and then you just find out your kid's, feel really good about themselves even when they mess up really bad. It's great. And in Christians, Christians, we kind of had our own way of dealing with it. We, you know, they really, you know, when I, when I was first beginning as to be a youth pastor, we, we had this, we had, there was this curriculum going around that, uh, I'm, thank God Heather and I didn't use. I, I thank God we didn't use it. It's called Growing Kids God's Way, which meant that that was the only way and every other way was the wrong way. <laughs> You can either grow kids God's way, or if you did it some other way, I guess that was Satan's way. And they would, they would basically say, hey, your child is sinful, and so you have to just 
I mean, put them in a put them in a, in a in an environment that really keeps them from sinning. And if you could just do that, if you'll just stick to your guns and tell them enough Bible verses, and you know, only let them wear denim skirts and not wear TV and all, you know, whatever it was, right? You had to, you know, I mean, whatever it was. That they'd be, they would be perfect. I mean, to the point where we had people coming and telling us, hey, God told me that you should homeschool your kids, Aaron. And I just said, well, I don't, he didn't tell me, so whenever he tells me, then I'll do it. And guess what? Rousseau was wrong, and, and, and John Locke was wrong, and Dr. Spock was wrong, and growing kids God's way was wrong. None of it fixed the problem. Only Jesus can fix the problem. We hear about systems and structures, right? Systems and structures all the time. Hey, they oppress people, and yes, they do, right? There's, there is oppression built into them. And so what are, we, what, are we, what are we being told right now? Tear them down, tear them down, tear them down. Build them back up. Put, put all the people that were oppressed, put them on the top. Well, guess what will happen? You'll just have a different set of oppressors. That's it. It will not fix the problem. Look at all the revolutions. All it does is turn it upside down, and there's still oppressors and oppressed. And you know this, right? Because in, in all the, the however many years people have been around, not one revolution has produced a perfect society. We think about that with technology. Oh, the technology, the technology. You know, we can, we, can, we can produce enough food to sustain everybody two or three times over right now, and we still have people dying of starvation. And technology has helped lift people out of poverty, but it sure hasn't ended crime. It sure hasn't ended trafficking. And in fact, people will use that same technology to, 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 to move grain and food all over the world. They'll use the same technology to human traffic people. To set up, you know, pornography on a scale that we, we, we can't even understand. To launder money, to do evil, to, to, to have the same problems that we've always had because technology will not fix the problem. You see, we're not evolving. We're not, evo- we're, we're, we're not getting better and in, in just... You know, eventually all the problems are going to be gone, right? We, we may have more resources. We may use them better. Technology has helped lift people out of poverty, but it has not cured the problems that we always have had in society, and it won't. It won't because the problem is, it says sin is reigning, right, in verse 21. The fire is always burning, Billy Joel tells us. The only hope that we have is the gospel. And in verse 15, it says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. The free gift is not like the thing that got us here. The free gift says, if for if many died through one's trespass, how much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following the many trespasses brought justification. For if by, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Therefore... As one man, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience many will be made righteous. You see, Adam's trespass, it's called. Adam's, Adam's sin brings death. It brought some different kinds of death. It brought spiritual death. The Apostle Paul will say this in his, in his letter to the Ephesians. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But you have been made alive in Jesus by God himself. You are born spiritually dead. You're born spiritually dead. But not only that, is you face mortality. You, you face physical death. And we see it all the time. 
2021, we've, <laughs> we've heard about it a lot. We've talked about spiritual, we talked about physical death a lot. It's been on the news. It's been on people's minds. You get reports every day on the news about how many people died. Another fact, that that's another consequence of Adam's sin. We also see eternal death being cut off from God because we have seen that his, it is, when you reject God, you are cut off from him. You are, you are cast out. It was, it, you are not a part of his family by your own choice. And so what Paul is saying says, man, this is the result. This is the result of one person's sin that led to everybody else's sin, right? One person, one person sinning led to all these problems for him and for everybody else. But the gift is greater than the trespass. The gift of Jesus, it, it far goes beyond the trouble that the sin caused. Commentator Cranfield, he remarks, that one single misdeed should be answered by judgment that is perfectly understandable. That the accumulated sins and the guilt of all the ages should be answered by God's free gift. This is the miracle of miracles utterly beyond human comprehension. What Cranfield is saying is like it, it makes sense that one person sinning, one person going against an almighty God who, who says, hey, don't do this. And they say, okay, I won't, and then does. It's not that hard to believe. It's not that hard to understand that one really bad thing leads to judgment. He said, but what's really hard to believe, what's miraculous, and this is what Paul is talking about. He says the free gift is not like, you know, because one man's sin led to everybody else being judged, it led to condemnation, and it led to everybody else sinning. He says, but what happens is the gift of Jesus means that all of them are forgiven, that all of them are passed over, that all of them, all of them are, 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 are covered by grace. He says, that's, that's the thing that's, a, that's astounding. And so you think about Adam's sin. You think about Adam's sin and go, okay, well, hey, we're going to undo that. Or even looking at you going, okay, you know, hey, I'm, I'm 42 years old, Aaron. When you accept Jesus, your life starts over. You start at zero. And so now from 42 until the day you die, you got to be really good because Jesus died for all those sins, which is a lot, you know, 42 years, but you start at zero. That's not, and, and, and Paul is saying that's not what happens. He's not just forgiving one debt. Okay, we're good. Don't accumulate any more. What Paul is saying is that it's a miracle that, that the gift of Jesus is not just that he clears the debt with Adam and he, and he clears the debt with you and starts over and then now you're at zero and so don't accumulate any more or then you'll have to get forgiven again. No, no, no. He says all of your debts are covered. All of your debts that, have, that you'll ever do from now on, from, in the, you know, from the time you were born until the time you die, every debt that ever, every family debt that you've ever done, everything that you've ever been responsible for, it is covered by the grace of Jesus. Jesus is the answer to this problem that we all have. And that is amazing. He says through, through, this, through one person's sacrifice. And some people will say, well, you know, these, these objections we have is like, hey, well, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm free. I'm not, I'm not under sin, right? It, says that, it said that death reigned. And in verse 21, it says sin reigned. And you're like, no, no, I'm free, right? And that's one of the, that's one of the lies that Western Christianity, that, that Western philosophy has has told you and told me that we are free to do whatever we want. You are not, because we have heard it over and over and over in the, in the first five chapters of Roman. You are only free to sin. That's it. You are a slave. You were born into slavery. 
a slave to sin, and only because of Jesus are you free not to be a slave to that. You say, well, I'm, okay, well, I'm, I'm independent, right? Why, why, does Adam's, why does Adam's sin affect me? And it's like, well, the answer is because it does. Because the same reason that, that, that your family's sin affects you, the same way that your, that you, that your father and your grandfather and, and the sins of, of the people in this country affect you and, your, and the cultural sins that we deal with affect you. You are not independent. You are not an island. And you, so, okay, well, but I'm good. And the answer to that is no, you are not. And if people go, well, well, look at so-and-so. I'm better than them. It's like, yeah, you're better, but you're not good. Paul has demonstrated it over and over and over and over again in these first five chapters of Romans that you will never live up to God's standard. You will never be good in reference to God. And so it says that Jesus and Adam are, are it, it's comparing them and saying that they're completely different. It says Adam, Adam turned from the Father in the garden. Jesus turned to the Father in the garden. Adam was naked and unashamed. Jesus was nearly naked and bore our shame. Adam's sin brought us thorns. Jesus wore a crown of thorns. Adam substituted himself for God and said, I can do what I want. Jesus was God substituting himself for sinners. Adam sinned at a tree. Jesus bore our sin on a tree. Adam died a sinner, and Jesus died for sinners. Now, people will say, well, okay, Aaron, I see verse 18. It says, therefore, as trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so the act of righteousness leads to the justification in life for all men. So is that talking about universal salvation? And the answer to that is no, because look at what Paul has said from the very beginning. He says, to those who, to those who believe, because he, he will not... Paul is not changing his mind in the middle of this letter. He is saying that the gift is greater, and the gift can provide salvation and justification for everybody so much more than the misdeed could provide condemnation. If, if, if the misdeed provided X amount of condemnation, Jesus, Jesus and his act on the cross provides however that much that is squared. Right? He, it can do so much. He it is not saying, that he's not saying universal salvation. He's not saying that, that it's just God, God did it all, and so what's the use? It's not saying that at all. He has said over and over to those who believe, to those who believe, to those who believe. And so today, I, I, I want you to think about how thankful you are for God's salvation. If you have taken that step of faith, I want you to thank God that the justification that you received is not like the trespass, that God is able to undo all the, all the generations of junk from your family, all the generations of junk from Adam to you, that God is able to undo, he, you are able to, to not just live, it says, but to reign in verse in verse. 20, it says this, Now the law came to increase trespass, and where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that, sin, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that you and I can reign in righteousness. So that grace would reign, that you would have grace after grace after grace. Like, like when you mess up, you have grace. Whenever you fall short, you have grace. Whenever you trespass, whenever you knowingly do something that goes against what God wants, you have grace. That when it comes to generational sin, that when it, when it comes, you're like, you know what, my, my dad did that kind of thing and I hated it, but now I find myself doing it and I hate that as well. You have grace and you have the ability to get out of that mess. 
You have the ability to take responsibility because you have grace that covers you and you have justification knowing that whatever you are held responsible for, God's already dealt with it. You have grace. And so you, you need to thank God and I want you to spend time thanking God this week. For the grace that you have, that grace is reigning in your life and that you will live forever. You will have everlasting life in Jesus. Not subject to spiritual death, not subject to to eternal death, life without God, but you will have eternal life, life with God. And if you haven't decided, if you're here and you say, well, I don't know, I, Aaron, I, I, don't, I don't really like federal headship. I don't, I, I'm, I'm free. I'm independent. I'm good. Let me tell you, you're not. You have to decide. Are you going to be on Team Jesus? And if you're not on Team Jesus, then you're on something else. You're on Team Adam. Well, I feel like I'm a little bit of both. No, no, no. You can't wear a jersey split down the middle. You were either on Team Jesus or you were on Team Adam, which is Team Sin, which is Team Trespass, which is Team Condemnation. Or you're on Team Jesus, which is Team Grace. Team Grace, reigning forever, eternal life. And so if you're, here, if you're sure that you're not a Christian or you're not sure, let me give... Look at your life in terms of everything that's influenced you. Thinking back to Adam, whose one trespass still affects you today. And you can can undo the results of that. You can undo the consequences of that by putting on the Team Jesus jersey. Would you do that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who provides justification, and you are a God who, who undoes generational, I mean, just generational, uh, generations of terrible things, God. So, Father, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that if, if anybody is, is tuning in that has not put on that Team Jesus jersey, they would. And for all of us that have, Father, this week, may we glorify you. May we we remember well what you did for us, that the gift was greater than the trespass. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.